So we're looking at Rituals of Resistance, a critique of the theory of everyday forms of resistance by Matthew C. Gutman. So this is a critique of James C. E. Scott. James C. E. Scott, you will of course uh, know if you watch this channel, is and any other anarchist channel on YouTube, is the author of Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. This is actually one of the, in my opinion, one of the best books of political theory to come out in the last few decades. Um, and it's one of those ones that's just a, a, a it's the nexus of a wealth of fantastic other writers. Um, it's a great introduction to things like urban planning discourse. Uh, it introduced me to Jane Jacobs. It's a fantastic introduction to um, uh, disputes between followers of Lenin versus followers of Luxembourg and so on and so forth. Highly recommended. Um, but uh, this is apparently a critique of his theories of resistance, James E. Scott's theories of resistance. And James E. Scott, um, I actually haven't read Weapons of the Week, um, but a little bit of this comes through both in Seeing Like a State as well as in uh, uh, his other more recent book, Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Earliest States. Similar in a lot of ways uh, to the content of... Graeber and Wengrow's uh, The Dawn of Everything, um, which is also pretty decent. I, I like Scott Moore. Um, but uh, essentially, one of the major forms of resistance by people who lack the power of a state um, is by rendering their, their goods and their dwelling places less legible to an overarching authority. So, for example, one of the one of the key ways that uh, states uh, attempt to control um, the the territories and the resources uh, under under their under their rule is by reorganizing it in a way so that it can be read at a distance and its behavior can be predicted and its yield can be predicted and accounted for. So one of the uh, one of the ways they do this is by making straight roads that are very wide, very visible, um, not complicated for a police force that is administrated from distance to to uh, to observe and to and to manage and to and to maintain order in. Um, there is a simplification of resources of the sort like uh, uh, Scott begins uh, seeing like a state with the example of scientific forestry, where in order to both maximize uh, yield efficiency as well as to have a clearer idea of what uh, what resources it actually has at its disposal, um, the Prussian state engaged in what was called scientific forestry, which involved the uh, the uh, sort of rigid compartmentalization of, I guess, like lumber crops um, in such a way as uh, forest diversity and the, the uh, complexity of, of navigating and harvesting that attends forest diversity, like the, the uh, diversity of trees, the diversity of um, uh, plants that, that surround the trees at the bottom level, the unevenness of the ground, the uneven distance between things and so on and so forth was removed so that it was a simple process of growing farming trees of a particular desired kind in one place and simply uh, being able to um, plan their growth cycles in a very, in a very simple geometrical way. Um, there were problems with this, namely uh, it caused uh, something called forest death. Um, because lack of diversity had a couple of impacts on the forests themselves as as like a more holistic thing. Um, namely, uh, there was a dearth of nutrients in the soil. Um, there was uh, a, a, a kind of general vulnerability that was introduced as a consequence of the homogeneity of the tree types themselves. So, for example, let's say if there's a fungus or a bug or some kind of to some kind of um, some kind of blight that damages one particular type of tree. Well, if you have a diversity of trees, that's not the end of your forest if that happens. But if you have only one type of tree and that one type of tree is vulnerable, that blight can wipe out an entire crop and an entire forest, and so on and so forth. The failure of uh, 
the, the clearing of the ground in order to make access and measurement more easy, also uh, over time remove nutrients from the soil so that over generations, the uh, forest land would become more and more barren and so on and so forth. Um, that's, that's a, that's an incidental problem of legibility making. Um, on the resistance side of things, uh, peasants who grew crops that were then taxed by a state authority, for example, um, and this is something that, that, uh, precedes, uh, really the earliest, uh, the earliest states, not just, just, just a modern state thing. They could choose to prioritize crops that, for example, grow underground. So while it's very easy to tax, um, wheat and corn growers and so on and so forth. It's a lot harder to actually tell exactly where the peasants have hidden their tuber plants, so on and so forth. Sunday, have you read The Art of Not Being Governed? No, I've only actually read uh, two things, two full books by Scott, and that was Seeing Like a State and um, Against the Grain. Uh, I do need to read The Art of Not Being Governed as well as uh, Weapons of the Week, um, but Scott is fantastic. So anyways, uh, this is a critique of Scott by uh, Matthew C. Gutman. I think I've actually read some stuff by him before. The name rings a bell. But this is called Rituals of Resistance, a Critique of the Theory of Everyday Forms of Resistance. And there is a footnote here, which is not on the first page. I'm going to go to the bottom. So we have notes. Um, I think Nancy, uh, Shepard Hughes, who's next team. Oh, this is just thank yous. Okay, never mind. We don't need to, we don't need to see that. All right, so we're going to, this is about 14 pages long. We're going to just jump right into it. In the context of new world orders threatening from above and new popular struggles breaking out from below, description and analysis of mass protests in Latin America is confronted for the need, with the need for comprehensive theories of social conflict. To account for these developments among the subaltern classes, Latin Americanists are increasingly turning to the views of James C. Scott regarding everyday forms of resistance, quote-unquote. I hope to show that important aspects of his model hinder our efforts to understand and develop theories of conflict in Latin America. Gilbert Joseph calls Scott's, quote, the most visible and polished statement of what now constitutes a vital current in peasant studies, unquote and goes on to suggest that his, quote, analysis of everyday forms of peasant resistance can contribute valuable insights to a broader conceptualization of Latin American banditry, unquote. Susan Eckstein introduces a survey of the varied forms of protest in Latin America by citing Scott on hidden forms of peasant resistance and extending these forms to other economically subordinate groups. She says that Scott, quote, correctly and insightfully argues that peasants frequently engage in everyday forms of resistance, unquote, although she quickly adds that, quote, such quiet forms of defiance rarely result in major change, and that, uh, uh, and, and also discusses more direct and explicit uh, forms of resistance. Levine and Mainwaring call one of Scott's books, quote, a major recent statement, unquote, in the tradition of studies on popular classes. Widespread and growing attention in studies of Latin America is thus being given to Scott's work, um, in Joseph's and Eckstein's cases, at least, this is ironic because both these writers go on uh, to refute what I shall call the second half of Scott's theory, the first half being roughly, that we must learn to appreciate covert and unorganized forms of resistance. The second, that these have become the only viable forms of resistance for the exploited and oppressed in the world today, and therefore the most reasonable focus of scholarly attention. Latin Americanists could be lulled into such a response to world events, a recognition by rational intellectuals, quote-unquote, that times have changed forever. Fortunately, popular struggles in the region will not allow us this conceit. It might be argued that Scott does not discount overt resistance, but merely calls attention to the fact that covert resistance is more frequent. In fact, however, he does frequently and explicitly oppose the two forms. Further, although simply to note the preponderance of covert forms of struggle may have been a novel insight at one time, today it too often serves to trivialize social conflict. The everyday forms of resistance noted by Scott are similar to what Max Gluckman calls rituals of rebellion. Though the two writers come to quite different conclusions, Gluckman shows that these symbolic rebellions against authority, which he examined, were based on an, quote, acceptance of the established order as right and good and even sacred, unquote and represented and helped to achieve the practical, the practical acquiescence of the politically subservient to the social order. Scott's peasants seem to have inherited a similar underlying acceptance of society as it is. It's inevitability, if not its justice. But identification with authority does not dispute the structures of power any more than do the rituals of rebellion which interested Gluckman. <clears throat> 
Latin Americanists should seek to understand and valorize spontaneous forms of resistance, but we must not overlook manifestations of organized resistance among the proletariat as well as the peasantry, on the ground either that they have been overstudied or that they are inimical to the primary concerns of these classes. Um, well, I agree first and foremost with the uh, language here that we must not overlook manifestations of organized resistance um, on the ground that they are inimical to the primary concerns of these classes. They also can be. Um, there, There is such a thing as a protest that can fail. There is such a thing as an overt act of resistance that can have a perverse effect. Um, I'm hoping that this isn't just a, a dogmatic defiance of, of that. Scott has developed his theory of resistance in three books. The Moral Economy of the Peasant, Rebellion and Subsistence in Southeast Asia, Weapons of the Weak, Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance, and Domination and the Arts of Resistance, Hidden Transcripts. In Moral Economy, he sought to contrast rebellion and unrest with alternatives to such popular forms of struggle. The tide of national liberation movements in Southeast Asia was clearly subsiding, and he was concerned with predicting future forms of overt and covert rebellion. Resistance was not yet a keyword for him among the Malay peasantry. In this research, he was directly following Thompson's Moral Economy of the English Crowd, as well as the work of Hobsbawm, Genovese, Davis, and others, though he distinguished his position from that of Hobsbawm and Genovese. Um, following Scott, uh, reg- sorry, that, that's the in the citation still. Regarding popular defiance of the established order, he wrote, quote, these counterpoints may have become may become uh, an institutionalized and harmless form of symbolic protest, which, like the royal buffoon, strengthens the existing order. Or they may become the normative focus of religion or political uh, movements, uh, with an insurrectionary potential. It is not their existence that is notable, for they are well nigh universal. Um, as its subtitle, Rebellion and Subsistence in Southeast Asia, indicates, a moral economy is based on theoretical conclusions with regard to a limited geographic and cultural area in which Scott has expertise and represents a more nuanced approach to resistance in its various expressions and interrelations with other phenomena. Among other things, it helps explain overt rebellion in times of crisis like the Depression of the 1930s. Have you made a video with book recommendations? Yeah, actually, uh, fairly recently I did. It's on the, uh, it's on the channel. Legibility can cause fragility seems probable. It's not legi- legibility that causes fragility. Um, legibility is in the advantage of the the hegemon or the sovereign or whoever controls what is made legible. Um, however, a condition of legibility may be a level of uniformity, a lack of a lack of density of complexity, I guess, of layers of complexity, that makes the thing being monitored and observed and planned more. Uh, let's say more generally vulnerable so think of like a a, like a lattice network right like if if um if you have like a single a single plank of a material and there's a crack that crack might go all the way through but if a single piece on a lattice cracks that's okay because that doesn't mean the lower parts are themselves damaged something else that um something else that uh scott brought up in another paper that we looked at a little while ago, this this paper is not by Scott. This is a critic of Scott, but something that Scott brought up in a paper we looked at uh, a couple days ago um, made the point that one of the things that happens under a patriarchal system is you have a common and distinct set of concerns and grievances between men and women, with the result that women tend to find uh, common common ground amongst each other and common. Uh, things to discuss, to talk about, uh, to organize in common places and so on and so forth away from men, which means that a, a perverse, I mean positive, but a perverse uh, consequence of a patriarchal system, one of them, is that it creates, as it were, a unified class identity um, and, and indeed the conditions of covert organization for women against men. Um, and in addition to all of this, like, uh, because there isn't that intermingling between the two, a grievance against men now becomes an increasingly inciting force for all women categorically. 
Whereas, if that wasn't the case, if men and women intermingled more, had more equality, and so on and so forth, the grievances of one might not be matched by the grievances of the other, and as a result of that, the community as a whole might remain a lot more stable. Does that make sense? So, um, simplicity and legibility, they aren't themselves fragile making. Um, well, simplicity maybe. Um, but legibility is not necessarily uh, fragility. Um, although it is a vulnerability on multiple grounds. If something's legible to one party at distance, it's legible to another party at distance. So just as, for example, um, the, uh, the, the, the making legible of a city makes it easier to police, it also makes it easier to invade. Um, ancient history is full of examples of invading armies coming in, finding themselves lost in the dark in the winding streets of an old town, and being butchered. Um, I think there's a couple of cases in Livy and um, Thucydides like that. I can't remember. It's been a long time. Um, so, like, it, it's, it's, you know, like, it, it's, there's, there's, there's a, there's a toss-up. Um, that being said, if, if you have only short-term interests, obviously, uh, legibility making can be very advantageous if you're, if you don't, for example, care about what happens to the people who, let's say in the case of scientific forestry, live beyond you and have to live with the consequences. Because one of the problems with this is that a lot of the consequences of, these legi legible making uh, practices is they don't manifest for a significant amount of time. I digress. Let's get back to this. Beginning with weapons of the weak, Scott both extends his argument to include the peasantry throughout the world and history in general and explicitly seeks to diminish the significance and study of overt forms of resistance. He writes, quote, It occurred to me that the emphasis on peasant rebellion was misplaced. Instead, it seemed far more important to understand what we might call everyday forms of peasant resistance, the prosaic but constant struggle between the peasantry and those who seek to extract labor, food, taxes, rents, and interest from them. Most of the forms the struggle takes stop well short of collective outright defiance. Here I have in mind the ordinary weapons of relatively powerless groups, foot-dragging, dissimulation, false compliance, pilfering, feigned ignorance, slander, arson, sabotage, and so forth. Insofar as, uh, unquote, insofar as Scott insists that greater attention be paid to the quote-unquote hidden transcripts, there can be little disagreement. That, quote, the emphasis on peasant rebellion was misplaced is another matter. I haven't read it yet, but I think the hidden transcripts refers to just this, for example. Um, let's say feigned ignorance. You there, you saw who vandalized the cardinal's carriage. Me? I didn't, I'm so sorry, my lord, I didn't see anything. I was over there tending to my sheep. Something like that. Um, that, quote, the emphasis on peasant rebellion was misplaced, unquote, is another matter. The rare, heroic, and foredoomed gestures of a Nat Turner or a John Brown are simply not the places to look for the struggle between slaves and their owners. It's an interesting statement. One must look rather at the constant grinding conflict over, f over work, food, autonomy, ritual, and everyday forms of resistance. Unquote. Far from needing to narrow our understanding of which forms of resistance are worthwhile to study, we must study both overt and covert forms and the relations between them. I actually agree with this critique so far. Um, I agree. Um, that being said, like if you're looking specifically for uh, methods that are eff let's say, efficiently efficacious in and of themselves, um, the the slaughters by someone like Nat Turner, you know, probably are not like a, a thing you want to look for as as your go-to, as like the core of your plan. It can still, it can still have effects, but it's a bit more than feigned ignorance. Well, I'm just picking out one example. I'm just, I'm just giving an example of like what a faint, what a, a hidden transcript is. Um, quote, Scott argues that peasant rebellions are few and far between. Instead, it is more enlightening, for whom, to understand uh, what can be called everyday forms of peasant resistance. That covert forms of struggle may in certain, even many, historical circumstances be more frequent does not mean that overt forms should no longer be studied. Besides, the emphasis here is wrong. 
It is not a question of overt or covert in isolation. Rather, at least in Latin America today and historically, these forms occur together, alternate, and transform themselves into each other. Given the current widespread ideological pessimism, taking this dangerous dualism literally would drown overt resistance and rebellion in intellectual despair. Well, the feigning of ignorance would be the public transcript. The hidden transcript is that which isn't practiced in view. Uh, no, no, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes, you're right, sorry, just, just a point of clarification. So the act of feigning inference, that's public, that's legible. Um, that, that's, that's obviously like a communication with like an official or whatever. I guess in that particular case, the, um, the hidden transcript would be, uh, would be the, the, the agreement to do so, or the deliberation to do so, or, or, or so on and so forth. The kind of like the, the, the sort of quiet background, um, loyalty between, uh, oppressed subjects that makes one decide to lie on behalf of the other one. It'd be that kind of thing. Does that, is that satisfying? Serious? You read more Scott than I have maybe. So yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought we were on the same page there. Um, at the beginning of Weapons of the Week, Scott states that, quote, the idea for this study, its concerns and its methods, originated in a growing dissatisfaction with much recent work, my own as well as that of others, on the subject of peasant rebellions and revolution, unquote. It is meant as a counterpoint to, quote, left-wing academic romance with wars of national liberation, unquote, answering, quote, dissident intellectuals from the middle or upper classes who may occasionally have the luxury of focusing exclusively on the prospects for long-term structural change, unquote. Elsewhere he writes, quote, My quarrel is not with the distinctions themselves, but rather with the tendency to assign greater historical priority and weight to the organized and political than to everyday resistance, a position that, in my view, fundamentally misconstrues the very basis of economic and political struggle conducted daily by subordinate classes, not just the peasantry, in repressive settings, unquote. Most of the works cited focus on peasant revolutions uh, and appeared during the Vietnam War, a time of great social tumult in general and widespread and deserved attention to wars of national liberation in particular. I'm a little bit sympathetic with Scott's pessimism in that respect, um, partially because like, I think there are other concerns here than just the efficacy of, uh, the potential efficacy of different modes of resistance. Um, among them, it's, it's not just, for example, oppressed peoples, uh, that are, that are vulnerable to, um, you know, crumbling and, and, and destruction and, and so on and so forth being undermined. Um, like sometimes, sometimes it is a victory if the oppressed community simply outlives, uh, the oppressor one and maintains a stability and maybe even maintains itself as the basis of the stability of a community as opposed to um, the administrative state overhead. I'm confused on the critique here. Scott seems to be saying that this is a kind of resistance that has gone underexplored, not that it's the only or most important form of resistance. There were quotes earlier on that seemed to indicate um, he thought there was an overemphasis on the other one. I think the author of this is taking that to mean uh, he wants a downgrading of overt forms of resistance in, in favor of that. So up here, um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, here we go. Um, these counterpoints may become an institutionalized and harmless form of symbolic protest, which, like the royal buffoon, strengthens the existing order, or they may uh, become the normative focus of religious or political movements with an insurrectionary potential. It is not their existence that is notable, for they are well known universal. Um, so he's he's suggesting here that popular overt defiance um, can can become itself can itself have a conservative uh, function I suppose is one way to put it it is perhaps no accident that uh, Scott Starr has been rising precisely in a period of retrenched conservatism within the United States this is a time when the preeminence when the permanence sorry 
of at least certain social orders seems to many scholars more realistic than it did in the 1960s. Scott's reality, quote-unquote, is no less a social product than those which he criticizes. It is much easier for scholars uh, in the United States today to dismiss peasant-backed revolution in the 20th century as, quote, at the very best, a mixed blessing for the peasantry, unquote, and that it, quote, uh, almost always creates a more coercive and hegemonic state apparatus, unquote. Roseberry remarks that Scott romanticizes the peasant past. To extend this insight, why is one left with the feeling that for Scott the only revolutions worth cherishing are those which occurred 200 years ago? Rejection of a unilit... Yeah, see, this this line here is, is what, he's taking, uh, what he's taking a shot at. Um, uh, uh, when he says, at the very best, a mixed blessing for the peasantry, referring to peasant-backed revolutions in the 20th century. That's... Um, and, when it, and when they almost always create a more coercive and hegemonic state apparatus. That would seem to be a, a strong critique of, of overt resistance. To extend this insight, why, okay, um, rejection of a unilineal uh, vision of historical progress does not require that we deny positive historical developments through popular revolutions in the present epoch. Um, let's see here, so that's footnote three. There's a second footnote we missed as well. Um, methodologically, I find Scott's argument similar to that advanced by those who have discovered the existence of classes in the United States and then use this to negate the social significance of gender and nationality or race. Race is no longer the issue. Classes, quote unquote, examining the interrelation of these features would seem the critical issue. Okay, so that's that's a harsh critique. I don't know if I agree with that necessarily. Um, three uh, further, Scott employs the debater's trick by tracing only left utopian romanticism to intellectual origins. Where do theories of everyday forms of resistance come from, if not from intellectuals? This line of approach gets us nowhere. Eh, eh. I, the theory does, but I don't think the the form of resistance itself comes from there. Like th these are more an anthropological issue. Like the theory is a description ultimately. It's not um it's not like a proposition. Um. Okay, here we go. Extrapolating from what he perceives as Malay peasants, quote, pragmatic adaption to the realities of their lives, Scott generalizes that, quote, the situation for most subordinate classes historically is one which surely sets limits that only the foolhardy would transgress. I'm going to stop saying, quote, it's dumb. Thus, in his attempt to get away from what he views as an overly romanticized model of popular resistance, Scott throws his weight behind an equally deterministic economism and pragmatic resignation to the status quo in the name of the oppressed, of course. It is not surprising that using an a sorry, I was doing push-ups before stream and I'm so sorry now. It is not surprising that using an, histor an ahistorical framework leads to writing off what one is cap incapable of explaining. Let me say it again because I, I botched that sentence. Thus, in his attempt to get away from what he views as an overly romanticized model of popular resistance, Scott throws his weight behind an equally deterministic economism and pragmatic resignation to the status quo, in the name of the oppressed, of course. It is not surprising that using an ahistorical framework leads to writing off what one is incapable of explaining. Yet, marvelous events remain to be explained. Rebellions do occur, and resistance does become overt and aim for structural change. I don't think he denies that, though. I think he, he denies that they frequently succeed. Which is true, they don't frequently succeed. People still give their lives for these goals in Latin America every day, which is noble, but it doesn't mean that it works. you got to be careful there. The rom this, is, this is a romanticism of its own kind if this becomes the sticking point in the argument. Scott notes that his is a study of, quote, local class relations, unquote, and that the state, uh, and that the state ethnic conflict, religious movements, or protest, and so on, are conspicuously absent, except as they impinge on these relations. We cannot, however, get far by arguing along narrowly social structuralist lines, describing the ideas of peasants, for example, as arising neatly from their class positions. Scott's ideas about class consciousness are socially constructed paradigms rooted in a reductionism that would have peasants and subordinate classes generally at all times and places resisting in like fashion because they recognize and accept their structural inferiority. So this is actually um, hinting at a... Uh, 
a potential danger or an, uh, a perverse consequence of Scott's theorizing about this kind of thing in the, in the first place, in that by turning it from a locally rooted act of resistance into a schema to be deployed, because it's been published as a theory, um, it introduces the exact same kind of homogeneity that makes... Uh, well, it introduces that very legibility into, into the practice by making it formulaic. Um, this is reminiscent of Weber's rational order. Quote, the status quo tends to be rational and uh, the status quo tends to be rational and radical change, non-rational, unquote. This essentializing approach to the peasantry is ultimately a form of vulgar materialism. Uh-oh. I don't like that word. <laughs> I don't like where this is going. <laughs> This critique needs to stay focused to be valuable. Yeah, it does. I think this is this is the first red flag I've seen. This essentializing approach to the peasantry is ultimately a form of vulgar materialism. The notion that economic class position determines social consciousness overlooks important life experiences uh, other than economic ones and sets up a dualism in which ideas are determined by outside quote unquote material factors instead of existing. And, uh, and changing in complex relation with them. I don't think, I don't think Scott does that. One does not, ex uh, quote, one does not expect Das Kapital to come from working class pubs, although one may get something quite close to the labor theory of value, unquote, Scott writes. Supposedly, therefore, quote, something quite close to the labor theory of value, unquote, could have been arrived at far more easily had someone in the 19th century only known to look for the hidden transcripts of the powerless, their rumors, gossip, folktales, songs, gestures, jokes, and theater. It is passages such as this which show the inherent problems in the dichotomy between overt and covert. Peasant understanding supposedly extends so far that, quote, no one who looks even slightly beneath the fairly placid official surface of class relations in Sedaka, Sedeka, I'm going to say Sedeka, Sedeka, Malaysia, would find it easy to argue that the poor are much mystified about their situation. To explain their lack of overt knowledge to this social order, Scott implies, that peasants are too smart to risk themselves on a losing proposition. For this reason, he, for this reason, he disallows the concept of hegemony, arguing that it, quote, ignores the extent to which most subordinate classes are able, on the basis of their daily material experience, to penetrate and demystify the prevailing ideology, end quote. This is a description of society as if it were populated by neat cultural isolates. Scott compares what has come to be known as the, quote, myth of male dominance, unquote, to what he apparently would style the myth of the subordination of the peasantry. Just as women in certain societies may exercise real, if not formal, power, quote, in much the same fashion, one might contend that the peasantry often finds itself finds it both tactically uh, convenient as well as necessary to leave the formal order intact, while directing its attention to political ends that may never be accorded formal recognition. Unquote. In appropriating Scott's becoming a Bidenist, in appropriating a model from the anthropological discourse on gender, however, Scott has missed the point. The argument is that in many peasant societies, neither the man nor the woman has more power, and therefore male domination is more myth than fact. Let's see, Rogers, 1975, what is this? Oh, Rogers and Susan Carroll, I know Susan Carroll. I don't know, sorry, I don't know Susan Carroll, I know Susan Carroll's writing. Female forms of power and the myth of male dominance. Hmm, that might be a good one for the theory meter. Um... Surely, Scott does not mean to argue that this is the case with lower classes and elites, but this is where his logic might lead. When Scott calls, quote, folk descriptions of what is happening adequate and at the same time far richer in a mode of meaning than anything academic political economy could possibly provide, unquote, he is doing more than glorifying common sense peasants and chastising know-it-all intellectuals. To be a peasant or proletarian means to Scott to have quote-unquote adequate descriptions of life, for he is allowing no other context than that in which action against domination must be hidden, 
or it will be crushed. With domination and the arts of resistance, Scott extends his theory, now called infrapolitics, to apply to all subordinate groups, rural and urban, who dare not speak in their own name. In criticizing the essentialism of this work, I am not arguing against broadly comparative studies or denying the importance of discerning commonalities among peasants or other social categories throughout the world. I am suggesting, however, that claims to having discovered shared characteristics must be carefully scrutinized to see how they handle, especially the matter of cultural and historical context. Scott writes, quote, The political advantages of impromptu action by a crowd conceal a deeper and more important form of disguise and anonymity, without which such action would not be possible. Um, Syria says, that's to, with respect to the previous point, that's just not true, though. Like, his entire point is that resistance against domination just manifests differently in public, not that it's always crushed. I think what's happened is he's made um, Scott overspoke, not in a damnable way, but he overspoke. And he uh, he gave a description of a fact, which is that most forms of overt coercion fail or are even um, deployed perversely to reinforce uh, the, the overarching oppressive order. Um, and that's been read by um, this, this fellow as uh, fairly, I think, um, as a disavowal of overt action pretty categorically. It definitely stands as discouraging. Um, If this means that without spontaneity, anonymity, and disorganization, impromptu action is impossible, it may be true, but it is a tautology. Um, sorry, let me start from the beginning here. Scott writes, The political advantages of impromptu action by a crowd conceal a deeper and more important form of disguise and anonymity without which such action would not be possible. If this means that without spontaneity, anonymity, and disorganization, impromptu action is impossible, it may be true, but it is a tautology. If it refers instead to action in general, this is a different matter, implying the all-knowing and all-powerful state that lurks beneath the surface in so much of Scott's recent work. Despite disclaimers, Scott pits gradual, incremental, and all but hidden change against self-consciously directed and radical change. Quote, petty acts of resistance have thus changed or narrowed the policy options available to the state. It is in this fashion and not through revolts. What if that emphasis is there? Emphasis is added. Okay, that's not that's not Scott. I don't like that he added that emphasis. I don't think that emphasis was good to add. I think that was uh, obscuring. Um, <clears throat> but I digress. Uh, petty acts of resistance have thus changed or narrowed the policy options available to the state. It is in this fashion and not through revolts, let alone legal political pressure, that the peasantry has classically made its political presence felt, unquote. In developing his theory that covert forms of resistance are not merely the most common, but also the most efficacious, Scott says that, quote, persistent practice of everyday forms of resistance underwritten by a subculture of complicity can achieve many, if not all, the results aimed at by social movements. He also metaphorically speaks of the microscopic growth on barrier reefs against which the uh, ship of state eventually runs aground. Um, I like that analogy, actually. Colburn picks up on this theme, stating that everyday forms of peasant resistance may lay the groundwork for substantial social change by eroding away an unpopular regime. If all these acts of petty resistance add up to so much, where are the historical successes? I think we need to be really careful here. He's not saying, Scott is not saying, that overt forms of resistance don't work. He's saying that the forms of resistance that work the most are the everyday forms. But these aren't competing with each other. Overt forms of resistance are events. They're things that people do, right? At a time. Um, covert forms are are different. It's the, it's the we're withholding our crops. The state no longer has access to the full range of the resources it actually technically owns on paper. Um, it doesn't have the ability to uh, find its way easily through, through our cities or to access our local knowledge or our knowledge of each other's actions. Things like that. <clears throat> That cumulatively can add up to a situation where the state finds itself in an intractable position, either because of its ignorance or because access to the things that it needs has been slowly eroded. Ergo, the ship runs aground against the coral, right? 
or not doesn't run aground, but it runs against the coral. Um, the uh, the the hidden rocks under the waves. Properly. So it also criticizes what he calls the safety valve theory of Gluckman and others, through which certain acts of resistance are quote unquote allowed by states <clears throat> in order to diffuse more formidable opposition, as underestimating the importance of everyday resistance to social change. We might have to do some of our uh, drama stuff tomorrow just because my uh, my voice is going. Um does the realism of rational intellectuals in the 1990s dictate settings one, setting one's sights only on microscopic social change? To acknowledge and locate such subterranean subversion is one thing. To privilege it as the height of pragmatic resignation in the face of a social system that is inescapably there is another. I'm going to reread that. Does the realism of rational intellectuals in the 1990s dictate setting one's sights only on microscopic social change? To acknowledge and locate such subterranean subversion is one thing. To privilege it as the height of pragmatic resignation in the face of a social system that is inescapably there is another. The question, ultimately, is not that these forms of protest must be acknowledged as such, but whether the accomplishments of peasants and the poor and oppressed in general in their day-to-day -day lives are essentially all that they realistically can achieve. So he's reading this as discouraging overt action. And I can see how reading this you would, be, like reading these lines, you would be in, discouraged from overt action because overt action, overt action is dangerous. There are ways in which it can be turned against you. Um, and there are very strong reasons to think that covert action has long-term positive effects. Why would you choose the more dangerous, risky option? When they're framed as, sorry, God, when they're framed as options. Sorry, my, uh, my tongue actually got stuck between my teeth and the cough drop for a second. That was weird. Um, that was a gross sound. Um, the question ultimately is not that these forms of protest must be acknowledged as such, but whether the accomplishments of peasants and the poor and oppressed in general in their day-to-day -day lives are essentially all that they can realistically achieve. Nor should we overlook the fact that participants in overt forms of resistance often provide more room to maneuver for those similarly inclined but more hesitant. Sometimes. you got to be careful. I think Gaza is a case in point. The 10-7, uh, uh, whatever else it may be, um, however vile the acts may be, it was an overt form of resistance. Um, so it also created the pretext under those conditions for essentially the evacuation of Gaza of Palestinians by the Israeli state. Um, leaving aside the evil of, of murdering, uh, however, however many hundreds or over a thousand civilians, um, it, it created the conditions in which there was enough global confusion about the moral status of Palestine, that Israel was able, with more or less no resistance, to go in and decimate uh, a civilian center um, occupied by two million people. According to Scott, quote, uh, quote unquote, bread and butter issues um, are the essence of lower class politics and resistance. So, sorry, the reason why I'm going into that is that in this particular case, um, an overt form of resistance, though it failed, did not also provide more room to maneuver for those similarly inclined but more hesitant. It actually did the opposite. So in this case, in the, in the case of uh, Hamas and Gaza, um, Scott was 100% correct. Um, according to Scott, bread and butter issues are the essence of lower class politics and resistance. Why would the lower classes, or at least the rational ones, ever sensibly put at risk their highest concerns, bread and butter? And I think, I think here again, too, the first intifada was very effective primarily because there was much less in the way of organized gang violence um, against uh, Israeli soldiers. There definitely was. Like, it wasn't, it, it was it was certainly more peaceful than the second intifada, but it wasn't peaceful. Um, but as a consequence of what happened, the, um, the eyes of the world became much more sympathetic to Palestinians as a result. The second intifada had the opposite effect. Um... And the uh, the over reliance on terror attacks, uh, one one might say in, in the vein of this paper, the over reliance on overt forms of resistance or something, to which the only options were things like terror attacks, um, 
had a had a serious uh, negative effect for Palestinians um, in terms of how they were viewed and how much they were supported by international onlookers. Wait, but Scott doesn't think the state is all-knowing? No, no, he's, he's saying that tongue-in-cheek. He's not saying that Scott thinks the state is all-knowing. Um, I mean, maybe implying the all-knowing and all-powerful state that lurks beneath the surface in so much of Scott's recent work. Um, no, I think, he's, I think he's saying there's sort of an implicit treatment of it as being as powerful as it aspires to be. I don't know. That's not important, but we, we can press on. Um... I think, um, I think what it is, is despite, despite, uh, the core of Scott's work emphasizing the weakness of the state to these forms of resistance, um, I think, uh, Gluckman is reading Scott's pessimism. Is it Gluckman? Gluckman's the author, right? Gutman, not Gluckman, Gutman. Um, I think Gutman is, is, or there was a Gluckman, Gluckman cited earlier, I mixed the two up. I think, um, Gutman's reading his pessimism as essentially a de facto endorsement of the the omniscient the om, the omnipotence and omniscience of of the state um it may be argued that scott has smuggled class and class analysis into political science oh no Yet bourgeois historians and economists have long talked about class, as Marx pointed out. Further, further, Scott... <laughs> what a weird sentence. It may be argued that Scott has smuggled class and class analysis into political science. That's not, that wouldn't be new. That's, there's nothing new about that. Um... Yet bourgeois historians and economists... Okay. Further, Scott's audience extends far beyond the ranks of political science today. Colburn introduces an entire book dedicated to Scott's thesis. Quote, this volume inquires into how the rural poor, still the majority in the world, defend themselves against the predations of politics. Politics, a classless formulation, is used here. Is presented as the problem for peasants. How far we have come from modernization theory in which classless backwardness instead of politics was identified as the problem. Does not this understanding lead to the conclusion that perhaps, after all, peasants and popular classes in general stand little chance of changing their situation in life except within a millennial time frame? Scott writes, <clears throat> My analysis, therefore, is one that runs roughshod over differences and specific conditions that others would consider essential in order to sketch the outlines of a broad uh, approach and calls on others to ground these broad assertions in contexts that are both culturally specific and historically deep. I take him at his word and will use examples from Latin America to disprove his broad comparative theories. Here we go. Here's the meat of it. Scott in Latin America. How many pages we got left? We're on page eight, so we've got about, about six. How accurately does the following from Scott reflect Latin American reality? Quote, Infopolitics may be thought of as the elementary in the sense of foundational form of politics. Under the conditions of tyranny and persecution in which most historical subjects live, it, it is political life, unquote. Scott has apparently worked in societies in which crushing repression against organized protests is not just a great risk, but inevitable. Not all societies suffer the same conditions, and even in others that do, the consequences are not necessarily as uniform as he would have us believe. In Latin America, certain well-known uh, certainly well known for the violence of its military dictatorships and democracies, the last 10 years have been marked by a variety of popular protests and struggles. For Mexico, see uh, Ramirez uh, Saiz, 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 um, Monsivez, my, my Mexican history is not good. Um, I should fix that. Uh, and so on. Uh, main wearing and, uh, this, that's still a citation, long citation. There are forms of organization, certainly, indicate an awareness of the risks of organizing around against class elites. But they also reflect a determination to organize and transform rather than simply to cope. Perhaps Southeast Asia specialists have written inordinately on peasant rebellions and revolution, but this is not the case for Latin America, where studies of elites on the one hand and timeless peasants on the other have dominated academic discourse and, quote, order and social control rather than mobilization, defiance, and protest have been the focus of most scholarly concern. <clears throat> 
Nor is the problem that generalizing in itself is inappropriate to Latin America. Wolf long ago helped to bring Latin American ethnographies out of the doldrums of isolated community studies, emphasizing in particular the colonial and historical framework within which the region must be understood. As Chandra Jayawardena, as Chandra Jayawardena writes, quote, Peasant societies are only partially closed, and the local community of the peasant is only one system or set of systems of relations that govern his behavior, unquote. Tossig shows clearly what is common and what is particular to commodity production relations among certain contemporary plantation workers and miners in Colombia and Bolivia. Smith, disagreeing with Theta Skokpole uh, on what compels weak states to modernize, writes that, quote, until the 1980s, the state had little power over Guatemala's rural population. Um, he summarizes Scott Pohl's position as that states modernize, quote, to develop their infrastructural powers in order that they may not, that they not be taken over by already developed states, unquote, and goes on to argue that at least in Latin America, the military has been instrumental in the development of states, and further, these military apparatuses have arisen mainly, quote, in order to control local populations rather than to carry out struggles in the international arena. An underestimation of popular struggles, at least with regard to Latin America, certainly contributes to misunderstandings of the state and its development. Describing and analyzing hidden forms of struggle has been the concern of a small number of Latin Americanists. Nash, discussing the Chala offering among Bolivian miners, shows that their beliefs do not predetermine their behavior any more than does their structural position. As she makes clear, the miners will, in particular periods, use cultural ritual as, quote, a rehearsal that keeps alive the sentiment of rebellion until a historically appropriate moment, when it may reinforce political movements, unquote. Friedrich links the cessation of such rituals in the Mexican village of Naranja with the emergence of forms of rebellion of a quite different sort. Quote, the cycle of fiestas made many peaceful forms of competition possible and profoundly involved the emotions of the uh, nar Naranenos? Naranjenos? I think it would be Naranjenos. It seems likely that the curtailment, or Naranwenos, I don't know. It seems likely that the curtailment of such ritualistic expression after the early 1920s was connected with the subsequent channeling of interest and passion into the political violence and intrigue that later came to typify... When I, I want to look this up. Hang on. So, how to pronounce Naranja? Is it just Naranja? Naranja. 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 All right. Interest and passion later came to typify Naranja culture. To emphasize the centrality of human agency in social conflict, Friedrich adds that, quote, the reconstruction of political history calls as much for the inference of attitudes and ideas as for objective facts. This is a particularly critical point, one which agrees with Raymond Williams' observation that, quote, much of the most accessible and influential work of the counter-hegemony is historical, the recovery of discarded ideas or the redress of selective and reductive interpretations, unquote. In his discussion of popular religion and class consciousness in Nicaragua, Lancaster shows how, quote, the consciousness of the people ever erupts in counter-hegemonic flashes and whisperings and murmurings against the superaltern classes. Similarly, at the same time that Joseph calls for decoding what he calls popular knowledges, he cautions that, quote, to acknowledge peasants as the conscious subjects and in a real sense, the makers of their own history, one need not make inflated claims about the sophistication, quote-unquote, of peasant politics, unquote. If the subordinate classes already understand their social existence and there is no mystification in the form of fatalism, the primary explanation of their tolerance of the status quo must be military. There's a footnote here. Um, for this reason, among many, Giddens makes a distinction between revolutionary class consciousness and conflict consciousness. That's interesting. Okay. But even if this were true, but even if this were true, it would not explain why members of these subordinate classes, individually or collectively, ever knowingly risk their lives. As Mitchell notes, quote, the argument that choosing petty resistance rather than direct confrontation is the result of a rational decision depends not only on an evaluation of the situation in, in uh, Malaysia, Sadeka Malaysia, but on a general historical estimate of where peasant interests lie, unquote. Uh, 
Velez Ibanez, Ibanez, Velez Ibanez, in his highly original ethnography of families in uh, Ciudad, uh, Netzahuelcoyotl, shows that from the perspective of the oppressed whom he studied, police response and suppression not only indicated preemptive actions on the part of the authorities, but also could, quote, be looked at as a useful reaction for it signaled that protest had reached and vibrated the networks of the power holders, unquote. Coatsworth, in a recent summary of the state of scholarship on rural social conflict in Mexico, concludes that, quote, the significance of rural rebellion in Mexican history and in the historical evolution of other regions in Latin America remains underestimated, though less so now than at any time in the past. I'm, I'm perplexed as to what these examples are supposed to demonstrate, since they don't seem to provide anything that actually belies what Scott argued. Um, so they're, they're yeah, I, I don't know. Because a, a lot of these even seem to be the forms of covert resistance as well. Uh, President Sunday, I think this is mistaken. Peasants practicing everyday resistance wouldn't be agitating on behalf of peasants as a whole class. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, they wouldn't be overt forms of resistance, and therefore they wouldn't be organized in the same way. Like, resistance, as, as Scott refers to it, by being everyday resistance is quite literally the resistance that is exercised by people even when they're not directly organizing with each other. Like, it's the resistance of... of like the, the, the farmer or the local chief or something. Consciousness and the historical record. It is well and good to stir up the waters regarding multiple forms of resistance and perhaps especially the question of class consciousness, but Scott is in some respects raising a false argument about false consciousness. The dispute is not over whether the oppressed quote-unquote know anything about their oppression, but what they know and do not know, a question that may and should be asked, as Scott commendably does, of intellectuals as well. Throughout much of his discussion of consciousness, Scott is in reality dueling with the ghost of Lenin. He is certainly not the first to raise anarchist-inspired critiques of Marx and later Lenin. Indeed, in one form or another, such arguments have a pedigree extending back well over a century. With Lenin, the criticisms have centered on the related questions of revolutionary leadership and consciousness. It is the latter which interests Scott in particular. Especially in what is to be done, uh, Lenin insists, sorry, as I was saying, you're, you're going to find a similar critique in uh, Seeing Like a State in the, uh, in the section on, um, uh, is it Revolutionary How Hang on. Authoritarian High Modernism. So he... Uh, in, in the section on authoritarian high modernism, or the section following authoritarian high modernism, the, the second book of Seeing Like a State, um, this is where you get the section on urban planning, as well as the section on uh, theories of revolution, and whether they are organized from the top down, or whether they emerge from the bottom up, or whether there isn't a contradiction in one against the other. And in that section, you get... Uh, in that section, you get... Stop creaking. In that... I need to replace this chair. This is so bad. In that section, um, you get his... Uh, he takes sides with Rosa Luxemburg um, in her critique of Lenin, uh, who is fearful of the corrupting influence, the corrupting anti-revolutionary influence of uneducated uh, lower-class individuals who aren't part of the revolutionary vanguard, um, who may have an interest in just a return to the status quo and to something that, well, who do have an interest in a return to the status quo and a return to normalcy, um, who want to live their lives and so on and so forth. And so he wanted insulation between the vanguard and the common people so that the vanguard can plan without the uh, anti-revolutionary inclinations of the general people seeping in and corrupting their, their goals. Um, Rosa, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, counters this saying, well, hang on a sec. Um, what you've what you've effectively done under those circumstances is you've permanently neutered the uh, the very spontaneity and creativity of the people that communism is supposed to uh, liberate um, in order to protect the purity of a revolutionary movement that therefore can never actually evolve past the initial insurrection. It can only be essentially a state party in a situation of war. Uh, against its its own people, which it which it fears, when it is precisely the the freedom of the common person um, to be spontaneous, to create, to organize with each other, to learn, 
um, that it's supposed to be the primary advantage of uh, socialism and communism over over a, a, a traditional authoritarian state. It's not like a wishy-washy uh, internet anarchist thing where it's like, ooh, isn't isn't a lack of hierarchy and uh, and 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 promoting creativity and spontaneity isn't that loverly? Um, there's actually a a important structural weakness that emerges as a result of this. Namely, the Revolutionary Party becomes insular. It becomes unable to uh, adjust itself to the needs and wishes of the people generally, and over time it ossifies. And it, in effect, doesn't just become non-revolutionary. It also becomes stupid. Um, sorry, especially in what is to be done, Lenin insists on the necessity for class consciousness as opposed to what he terms trade union consciousness to be brought to the proletariat from outside by revolutionaries, case in point. He holds that trade union consciousness is often the spontaneous starting point of proletarians, but ultimately represents no deeper understanding than a recognition of the existence of two classes, capitalist and proletarian, whose interests are thoroughly opposed. Uh, I think this article predates Seen Like a State. It, it probably does, because he's not responding to Seen Like a State. Um, and he, uh, Scott, like, recapitulates himself a lot. To a certain extent, like some of his older books have been sort of rendered obsolete by his newer ones. They're still worth reading because they have case studies that are worthwhile. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, where was I? Trade union consciousness, Lenin writes, will lead to the acceptance of the inviolability of capitalism and enable proletarians to do no better than bargain for better terms for the sale of their labor power unless it is transformed into revolutionary understanding about the exploitative nature of all aspects of capitalism. In contrast for Scott, trade union consciousness, quote, is not, as Lenin claimed, the major obstacle to revolution, but rather the only plausible basis for it, unquote. This argument, best elucidated, best elucidated in Weapons for the Weak, requires an absolute identity between social class and social consciousness. Instead of analyzing a contradictory process, this mechanical materialist position ironically has much in common with the idealist view that ideas are the sole determinants of human activity. We'll see about that. That's a statement. Writing about a group of urban proletarians in the Tepito neighborhood of Mexico City, Reyes and Rosas explain how people in this once politically vibrant community were quote-unquote co-opted by the state. They show that much of the underlying social structure is generally hidden to most of those people, but they do not therefore dismiss the ways in which the Tepetinos think about themselves when they actively enforce the system of special favors through these corrupt leaders as mere false consciousness. Reyes and Rosas believe instead that the self-image of people in Tepito must be understood as dependent on the historical period in which it occurs. The Tepetinos become aware of themselves through comparison with others, and that in this way, at this time, their understanding of and relationship with the state is changing. In a parallel study in Tepito, Nivon 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 describes neighborhood identity as having been fashioned in opposition to what the residents conceive of as quote European gringo and socialist identities. They see themselves as the standard bearers of the national versus the western, meaning specifically the mestizo and not the Indian. While describing this sense of identity as a process of relations with others, Nivon notes the mystical character that residents of Tepito attribute to their lives. Quote, you might say that the same pride which argues that no western ideology can comprehend the people of Tepito has reinforced the isolation of the barrio with respect to other parts of the city, the sectarianism, and the development of ideologies uh, which themselves contribute to reinforcing the domination of various arms of the state over the barrio. I'm going to find out what this means quickly. Hang on. The barrio. That's a new word. That's a new word for me, at least. You can all laugh at my ignorance. That's okay. You're still paying me for it. Barrio is a Spanish word that means quarter or neighborhood. Got it. Okay. So when uh, when they say barrio, you can just substitute, like, sector or... or, or town or, or neighborhood or whatever. In a similar way, uh, Willis describes the refusal of white male British working class youth to compete in school as the authorities expect them to. The very act of conscious rebellion makes them complicit in their own uh, eventual entrapment. In specific contexts, a rational refusal to go along with authority may have unintended consequences. Eckstein describes another form of popular resistance to the law. Quote, the law is continually violated behind the scenes, not publicly in the streets. 
The regime, in particular, thrives on corruption. For decades, such everyday defiance of the law enhanced the regime's stability, unquote. Thus, resistance can sometimes serve to reinforce one's subordinate position, leading to what Warman refers to as, quote, the political disarticulation and atomization of the peasants by the canalization of their demands through state institutions in rural areas of Mexico. So, in a sense, these kinds of background forms of resistance can themselves be uh, co-opted as they form discrete organizations, um, Again, this is not everyday forms of resistance. You got to be kind of careful here. They're, they're merely covert. But covert forms of resistance can themselves uh, lead to the emergence of entities that can, themselves, that can themselves be co-opted. And so these things change from being forms of resistance to other avenues of control. This is in turn related to the point uh, Gluckman was getting at with his analysis of rituals of rebellion that reinforce the practical acceptance of power relations by symbolically disputing them. In part for these reasons, Mintz argues that, quote, it is important to understand how populations come to the recognition that their felt oppression is not merely a matter of poor times, but of evil times. When, in short, they question the legitimacy of an existing allocation of power rather than the terms of that allocation, unquote. Eckstein notes that in Latin America, quote, the recessions of the, mid of the mid-1970s and the early 1980s and the repressive policies of certain of the governments then in power generated some new types of urban movements, unquote. She writes that in countries such as Chile, Mexico, and Brazil, quote, popular economies, unquote, developed in opposition to the officially sponsored ones. She elsewhere notes the development of, quote, forms of disobedience, unquote, to the state, such as a grassroots housing movement, especially after the 1985 Mexico City earthquake, as the poor concluded they could not influence state policy in any way. It is a distinct possibility that despite many common features of the world economic system in third world countries, recessions and economic dislocations have not marked the past 15 years in Malaysia as they have in Latin America. It is difficult to generalize about peasants, proletarians, and protest. Um, Valais Ibanez describes, quote, men and, women projecting their, men and women projecting their sense of social autonomy by defying the power of the state, unquote. He discusses, quote, women who had braved the cudgels of police and men who had been beaten, shot, and abused by authority, and the role their experience played in the development of a cohort identity. This is similar in some respects to the informal social group discussed by Willis in 1981, though the social effects of the two are certainly not the same. The Super Barrio Brothers, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, as a critique so far, like, I think it's bringing up interesting questions. I don't know if I agree that a lot of these critiques stick. Um, oh, damn, we're almost at the end. Well, that's good, my voice is about to go. Um... Coordinated entity. This is similar in some respects to the informal social group discussed by Willis, so the social effects of the two are certainly not the same. These differences are especially noteworthy in Velez Ibanez's description of women's gaining, quote, a sense of political autonomy, unquote, through their self conscious self conscious confrontations with the state. Scott cannot account for such resistance because despite his chapters on history, he treats human agency as capable of adaptation to rather than transformation of new historical conditions. How do you transform new historical conditions? They're new. You don't even understand them yet. They haven't become normalized. They're new. You have to adapt first, then you can transform. By the time you can transform, you've adapted, in which case they're no longer new. Peasants, for instance, supposedly represent the hope of the future. Hope lies with the proles. Because they have come to recognize before the rest of us that there is no hope in the future. We need a quote for this, my dude. You can't just say that. But as Strathern makes clear, it is impossible to understand human agency outside particular historical frameworks. Quote, the concept of agency does not simply set up the question of whether people can know or determine interests for themselves and thus whether individual wills are crushed, bent, or expanded. It demands explicit attention to the context in which will is relevant to action, and thus how will as such is defined, unquote. 
I'm mispronouncing Barrio. Is it Barrio? A bunch of nerds. Or just Spanish people in the audience, either or. Um, the record from Latin America in no way substantiates the inference that organized overt resistance and rebellion, if it exists at all, is a dangerously romantic holdover from the past. I don't think Scott said that. Eckstein, for example, points out... <laughs> This is this is like the, a running theme here. Like the critiques are excellent of someone who said something that Scott didn't say. Um, like you could adjust this and make this into a very good a very good paper. Um, I just don't think a lot of the critiques actually obtain with respect to with respect to Scott. And I have critiques of Scott, but I'm not seeing I'm not seeing a whole lot here. That's uh, that's really sticking. Although it is an interesting paper, I am I am a, I do like it. Like I like this reading. This has been fun. It's dealing with interesting things in an interesting way. Um, it's just not really doing uh, double duty and like you know actually getting at a, a solid. Cre it's not debunking Scott, which is what it promised to do. Exting, for example, points out that the growing immiseration of the poor is leading to new forms of social protest and resistance against the Mexican government. This deepening poverty contrasts with the realistically rising expectations of even the poor in Mexico for most of this century. In a similar way, the new wave of protests contrasts with the relative social tranquility in Mexico for the past 60 years. Of course, sections of the popular classes may have the freedom to give up organized over its struggles altogether, but other sections are likewise free to continue to engage in such struggle. The question of historical and cultural particulars is key. And why must everyday forms of resistance necessarily be hidden? Although this may be the case, well, I mean, because uh, among other things, they can be policed out of existence if they're not. I think that's, that's, why they, that's why the hidden ones are the ones we talk about. Although this may be the case in Malaysia, and rebellions are rare indeed, but rebellions are, are not hidden, though. Rebellions are, are, and they're not everyday forms of resistance either. Rebellions are events. Those are, those are overt. For Latin America, we should not conclude that everyday resistance is always covert. Religious-based communities, squatters, struggles, and armed radical movements in parts of Latin America show that just as the existence of proletariat in Latin America does not automatically lead to proletarian or any other kind of revolution, neither does the existence of subordinate classes imply any particular form of resistance on the part of the uh, Los de Abajo. Quote, economic relations do not mechanistically determine whether, how, and when persons in subordinate positions rebel. Marx himself, it should be remembered, recognized that class politics vary with historical circumstances, unquote. As Joseph perceptively remarks, modalities of resistance vary according to differences in regional culture and structures of domination, quote. I, I, I have an additional complaint here. This guy quotes people a lot, but he doesn't quote them in a way that makes... A point. He quotes them in a way that sort of puts the cap on a point that he himself hasn't always uh, compellingly made yet. Um, regarding the social determination of truth from historical facts, he writes, quote, It was popular support that most determined the social content of banditry. I want to read more about banditry now. I want to, I want to look at uh, Joseph after this at some point. Such support, in turn, depended on the larger historical conjuncture, on the correlation of forces that frequently lay beyond uh, the control of bandits and the peasantry, end quote. I'm going to read that one more time. Such support, in turn, depended on the larger historical conjuncture, on the correlation of forces that frequently lay behind, beyond the control of bandits and the peasantry, end quote. Scott's plea that we not overlook more mundane aspects of resistance is what apparently appeals to Joseph. But as Joseph himself makes clear, quote, the larger question of peasant options and strategies across time and regions, unquote, remains to be resolved. I, too, applaud uh, Scott's contributions to uncovering hidden popular resistance and giving it new meaning. But his theory of resistance is ultimately and ironically a conservative one. It does not expect or explain change. But it does, though. Uh, it doesn't expect change, but why would you ever expect change? That's a, that's a pragmatic. You expect change so that you have the will to enact change, or because change has already been determined to be inevitable. But if we're talking about revolutionary action, it's not inevitable. Otherwise, you'll be complacent. But it absolutely does explain change. That's the whole ship running against the coral metaphor. That's the, that's the point. 
Rather, it tends to reduce social consciousness to the acceptance of a thoroughly tragic interpretation of contemporary reality, and is in its own way as profoundly romantic as any theory it challenges. Much work remains to be done on social conflict, including studies comparing Latin America with other regions of the world. Unfortunately, there is much in Scott's model that will hinder these efforts. Yeah, the attack on Scott is the weakest part of this. It's actually, it has some interesting things to say, but it's, it's, it's not a strong critique of Scott, ultimately. But it, it's, it's engaging in some interesting material. What was he citing by Weber? Well, he wasn't citing Weber. He, uh, he cited somebody who cited Weber. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, I think, like, if I were to make a critique of Romanticism, like, I think his, uh, he has a fairly uncritical onboarding of Rosa Luxemburg and, um, Jane Jacobs. Uh, and I, and I like, I like his, uh, stuff on Jane Jacobs and Luxemburg. Um, but, you know, like, they're not, they're not unimpeachable either. Um, Jacobs in particular has a lot of interesting ideas, but she doesn't really argue them very well, or does give a lot in the way of, like, a robust justification for them. Um, the, uh, the Death and Life of Great American Cities is a fantastic book, but it's, there's a, there's a bit of a hen or a rent about it, where, um, sometimes in place of, uh, sometimes in place of something that you can sort of objectively measure, she offers, uh, a, a, a very well-written narrative, and it's strong, but it's not, like, definitive, and it, it's... And it's honest. Like, there's information that you can't really like. Like, it's it's it's, it's a speculative book largely. She's she's making observations. She's saying this is what I think contributed to this, da, 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 and that's fine. Um, but it's not it's not definitive, and you have to kind of be careful there. I've read a few critiques of Jane Jacobs as well, um, especially on economics. Um, I'll have to think a bit more about those before I ever cover them. But yeah. Anyways, this was uh, this was good. Um, like I, 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 I don't I don't necessarily recommend um, the paper as uh, as like a good critique um, or an effective critique rather of, of Scott, but I think it's it's an interesting paper nonetheless. This was again rituals of resistance, a critique of everyday forms of resistance, specifically a critique of um, James C. Scott uh, by Matthew C. Gutman. Mm-hmm.